Hola amigos, ¿qué tal? Stuart here from Spain Speaks with the Spain News Update and the government's plan to hire foreign workers in their country of origin to fill the jobs that Spanish people don't want to do seems to have hit a bit of a hurdle. But more about that in just a moment. Firstly, a big thanks to all of the people that left comments on the last video. Lots of comments, lots of debate happening there as usual. Thanks to people that supported the channel through a donation or by buying me a beer or a coffee. Many thanks for that. Thanks to people that bought merchandise and a big thanks to my patrons on Patreon for your continuing support. Now, let's get into the news. And as I said, a government plan to hire foreign workers in their country of origin to fill some of the jobs that Spanish people no longer want to do, for example, in the construction sector or the tourism sector, seems to have hit a bit of a snag. As we can read here, DF blocks social security and transport from express hiring of foreigners for construction work. The lack of hundreds of thousands of workers in sectors such as the hotel and catering, transport and construction construction industries and the need to resolve the problem as urgently as possible have triggered tension between the Ministry of Social Security and the Ministry of Labour, which on the 7th of November clashed their points of view in the Delegated Commission for Economic Affairs. Vice President Yolanda Díaz prevailed over Ministers Escriva and Sánchez and put the brakes on the approval of an order to hire foreign workers to ease the tension in the labour market. So, hundreds of thousands of foreign workers that thought that they would be able to come to Spain and work in some of the sectors that we saw in that article, for example, the construction sector, the transport sector, and the hotel and catering industry, because as we know, those sectors are desperately trying to look for people to fill vacant positions, won't be able to come to Spain after all because the Labour Ministry has put the brakes on this initiative. So who is going to fill the jobs that, as I said before, Spanish people no longer want to do? Now, Spain's declining birth rate issue is also making headlines today. And as we can read here, Spain has the lowest number of births for the third year in a row. More people die in Spain than are born. This is confirmed by the National Institute of Statistics, which points out that since 2015, our country has suffered a progressive loss of population caused by an increasingly lower birth rate and a higher mortality rate. This trend was aggravated by the COVID pandemic, which caused deaths to soar to the highest figure since 19. A total of 493,776 people died, 152,461 more deaths than births. The latest INE statistics with data for 2021 reveal a certain moderation in the number of deaths, which fell by 8.7% with respect to the previous year, although with 450,744 deaths, it is the second highest figure since data has been available. Deaths exceeded births by 113,000. 364. So the lowest number of births here in Spain for the third consecutive year. And what's going on? What are some of the reasons why young people in this country prefer not to start a family? Now the scandal involving Spain's Equality Ministry and its minister Irene Montero continues to dominate headlines in this country and the opposition parties are now calling for Montero's resignation. Such a minister cannot be part of the Spanish government for one more minute, they say. Reactions to the position of the Minister for Equality Irene Montero on the only yes is yes law are constantly coming in and not only are there reactions from the public most of whom do not understand the reduced sentences but also from the political class many have been calling for the minister's resignation since Thursday in view of the trickle of sex offenders who are getting their sentences reduced criticism of Montero is on the rise as is tension over what might happen from now on the opposition focuses on Montero's resignation although they point to Sanchez as the person ultimately ultimately responsible. Even the Citizens Party, which voted in favour of the law, its spokesperson in Congress, Edmundo Bal, says it clearly. This would not have happened without amendments, he says. So it seems that everybody here in Spain is calling for the Equality Minister, Irene Montero, to resign because of the way they stuffed up that only yes is yes law. And as normally happens here in Spain, the minister is refusing to resign and blaming everybody else for the problems. And her attacks on the justice system here in Spain and and on judges has been scandalous. Now there's some good news and bad news for drivers today when it comes to petrol and diesel prices currently in Spain. And as we can see here, petrol prices continue to rise while diesel prices fall for the third week in a row. The price of fuels this week has experienced few changes with respect to the previous week. While petrol has continued the upward trend with an increase of 2.4 cents, diesel continues to fall and has now been down for three weeks
weeks after a fall of 1.3 cents. Thus, the gap between the two fuels continues to narrow to 15 cents per litre. According to data from the European Oil Bulletin published on Thursday, this week the average price of a litre of diesel is 1.739 euros per litre on average, while that of petrol 95 is 1.584 euros per litre on average. These prices include the 20 cent discount approved by the government. So that's what people are paying for fuel here in Spain at the moment, people that don't have electric cars yet. And the 20 cent per litre discount on fuel, which I must say has been very handy over the last six months or so, unfortunately coming to an end in January by all reports. Now, if you are one of the few people that has bought a totally electric car here in Spain, you might have noticed that there aren't many charging points around. And in fact, Spain should have installed 32,000 charging points for electric cars by 2022, but we are only 10% of the way there. The outlook for the Spanish electric car charging network is bleak, and this is confirmed with each new study on the number of charging points available in our country. The latest to put the data on the table is ANFAC's electromobility barometer. We analysed it a few days ago when we were trying to understand when Spain will catch up with Norway in terms of electric car penetration. At that time, we emphasised the number of charges available in the most advanced European countries, such as Germany, France and the Netherlands, the latter having by far the most plugs per kilometre. The data from ANFAC and its electromobility barometer for the third quarter of 2022 show a worrying figure. By the end of this year, we should have 45,000 charging points in our country if we want to meet the targets set out in the National Integrated Energy and Climate Plan. However, at the end of September, we had barely reached 10% of the growth we needed to achieve this. So there we go, the reality of owning a 100% electric car in this country, a serious lack of charging points. There should have been tens of thousands of them around the country, but it has not happened. So let us know if you are an electric vehicle owner here in Spain, and if you have problems charging your car. Now let's have a look at some of the comments from previous videos. One here from Hispania, 1975, Albacete is not a very nice city, but it's safe and has very nice things to visit in the countryside. Yeah, Hispania, thanks for the comment, and you're right, Albacete is not one of the most picturesque provincial capitals that I have seen here in Spain, especially if you compare it with places like Toledo, Segovia, Salamanca, Avila, for example, but then again, as you said, it is a safe city. And I would rather live in a boring, safe city than a dangerous, exciting city, but that's just me. But the impression that I got from my few days in that city, apart from it being a safe city, as you mentioned in your comment, it's also a city that has a fantastic quality of life, and the people there seem very friendly. So what more do you need? And the fact that there aren't a lot of tourists in a city like Albacete is also a pro, in my opinion. One here from Andrew, our retirement age for claiming the state pension has been rising for the last few years here in the UK. I'm expecting my grandchildren to receive a hundredth year telegram from the King before they get their pension. Yeah, Andrew, thanks for the comment, and it seems that the UK pension system, in a similar way to the pension system here in Spain, is going to have problems in the future to remain sustainable, and no doubt for similar reasons. For example, demographics. Here in Spain, you can find articles in the press almost every day telling us just how unsustainable the pension system here is. Yet no government seems willing to tell the truth or make the necessary changes to keep the system sustainable. So I imagine in a few decades time, there's going to be a lot of pensioners, myself included, struggling to make ends meet. So that's something to look forward to. One here from Marty, in Australia, you do not need to have contributed a cent to the government. Pensions are paid regardless. The country has also set up a compulsory superannuation scheme, which has to be met by every employer. There's close to a trillion dollars with those funds alone. Spain spends about 12% of its GDP on pensions. With the cash economy that exists, it's going to be interesting to see how the Spanish government will be able to pay pensions in the next few years. Yeah, Marty, thanks for the comment and some interesting information there about the Australian superannuation scheme. And for people that are not familiar with that scheme, basically, Australian workers fund their own retirements. Workers are forced to save a certain percentage of their salary each month, and employers have to match that percentage. But is it a better system than the one that we currently have here in Spain? I don't know. What do you think? Let us know in the comment section below. And which system will provide a better retirement for its citizens? Again, let me know your opinion below. One here from Sia Urix. I'll never understand why people want every country to begin to prioritise or even provide English over the native language. I remember seeing a ton of controversy over job postings in Japan that required demonstrable Japanese language skills as a requisite. The arrogance of some people 
usually English as a first language to not just expect but demand that English service. Yeah, I have a lot of pride about our language because it's an extension of our identity. I don't see why we should just loosely accept a new one. What a sad perspective. Yes, here, Eurex, thanks for the comment, but unfortunately, I think you've missed the point when it comes to learning a second language. I don't think anyone believes that English is going to take over and become the dominant language of this country, and if they do believe that, they must be crazy. Okay, sure, a couple of English words might creep into the local vocabulary, but that's about it. And the whole idea of speaking a second language, whether it be English or French or German in the European Union, is so that you can do business better and communicate more easily with foreign people. But hey, that's just my opinion, and you're quite welcome to yours. One here from Ken, NIE number should be on your visa in very small numbers, so take a picture of visa and zoom in. Problem is getting the appointment, Theta, for your TIA. I had someone with connections and got one for me. So they release them on certain days, and you have to call it the exact minute they release them. Two minutes is too late, as I found out. Yeah, Ken, thanks for the comment, and this is a debate that started on yesterday's live stream because somebody said that they are having problems getting their NIE E number, but I thought they might be talking about their TIE card and not necessarily the number, which I thought was easier to get. I've heard of a lot of people having problems getting appointments to get that physical card, but I haven't heard too many people having problems getting the NIE number, but I could be wrong. So if you are in the process of getting your residency done here in Spain and you're having trouble getting either your NIE number or your TIE card, let us know in the comment section below. Or on the opposite side of the scale, if you haven't had any problems getting both, also let us know. And finally, one here from Christopher Stewart. Honestly, I bought my second property in Spain. We closed today, in fact. I may be the first to say that both went smooth as silk. They are apartments. Maybe it's different. Yeah, Christopher, thanks for the comment. And good to see that you have not had any problems when it comes to buying property in this country. Yesterday, I posted a shorts video in which I said buyers better beware when it comes to buying property in this country because they're have been problems over the years. Lots of people have reported problems when it comes to property developers or constructors or builders, people in that industry. When we bought this house 20 years ago, there were endless problems with the builder. And lots of other people I know that bought property 20 years ago had similar problems. But maybe the sector has improved and they're a lot more serious now. Or maybe, Christopher, you have been extremely lucky. I don't know. On that note, I'll wrap the video up. Questions and comments, please leave them in the section below. Debate the video out as you normally do. Give it a thumbs up if you liked it. Thumbs down if you didn't. I'll see you in the next one. Hasta luego.